we're in Romans chapter 12, uh, a reasonable uh, commitment. And we, uh, we all graduated from uh, a systematic theology school last week as we finished the first 11 chapters of, uh, of, um, of Romans. And again, at the end, Paul could help himself, but he just breaks out into uh, to worship and that uh, wonderful doxology that he concludes uh, that uh, portion of that passage uh, with. Uh, like in all of Paul's letters, he goes from, we say, from doctrine to duty. In other words, from, uh, from explaining the theological implications of what he wants to say to a particular church or group of people. Then he moves into practical, how to apply it uh, to our lives. And that's what we get uh, beginning here in these first two verses of, of chapter 2. Uh, we could say the practical application would be how to know God's will. But actually, that's just a byproduct of of what else he really uh, wants to say to us uh, that's uh, critically important. Uh, there's probably uh, lots of verses in Romans uh, that uh, maybe we've come to love uh, over the years, in particular some of those passages from uh, Romans 8, that nothing can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus, and some of the uh, other wonderful great truths of Romans. But at the same time, if you were to only memorize two verses from the book of Romans, I would suggest it would be these two. These two can be transforming. These two might transform somebody's uh, uh, life uh, here uh, this morning, and certainly that's, uh, uh, that's my prayer. I, I, uh, I remember uh, being in high school, there were some contests at church, and if you memorized <laughs> Romans chapter 12, you, you, you get to go on this thing. I think it was like a trip to Disneyland or something, because I was like, I think I'll try this. I never memorized anything in my life other than somebody's batting average. And um, so I thought maybe there would be a crossover. There, there wasn't, but uh, uh, at any rate, I, got, I never made it past verse 1, but uh, I got the, I beseech you, uh, uh, my brothers, by, by the mercies of God. I didn't get a lot further than that on it, but it was interesting, uh, once I did come to the Lord, verses like this that talk about transformation, word metamorphosis. It's really a Greek word, we just say it in English, metamorphosis, and we understand what that is. Those became uh, critically important to me, because that's what I wanted. I wanted trans. Uh, transformation. So this has always been a, 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 a personal verse for me that's uh, meant a lot. I hope it'll uh, mean a lot to you. Now I've entitled it A Reasonable Commitment because it's all about a commitment, taking a commitment to uh, a, a different level. And we come to faith in Christ, we see a sinner's prayer, uh, we may make an altar call, we may pray uh, alone in private, whatever it is, and we come to faith in the Lord. And we've talked about the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. But Paul now calls us to something else, uh, uh, a complete commitment to the Lord. But his whole point is, it's the least we can do. It's a reasonable commitment. In fact, he'll even use uh, the Greek term where we get our word logical. So let's look at Paul's logical progression here. It does all flow together. Uh, the first step, uh, and let's read the text. Uh, Romans 12, uh, chapter 1. I beseech you. Therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So again, uh, the first point we want to make is that the importance of what has previously been stated when he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Two things about what's been stated. The obvious is that uh, he has spent 11 chapters explaining the fact that we're saved by grace, by grace alone. This is the fourth of four therefores in the book. And as uh, Dr. J. Vernon McGee used to say, when you see a therefore, look and see what it's there for. Because it's always referring back to something else. In chapter 3, verse 20, there's a therefore, we say, of condemnation. In other words, he's laid out the position that it doesn't matter if you're a non-religious person, a very religious person, everybody is condemned. And of course, in that chapter, in verse 23, his summary statement is, all have sinned to come short of the glory of God. In chapter 5, we have the therefore of justification, where Paul says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Justification, where the judge puts the gavel down and says, not guilty, a once-for-all statement that God makes on our behalf because we placed our faith in him of critical importance. There's the therefore, the third one, 
of, we say of assurance in chapter 8. Therefore, there is now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. We mentioned that in the Greek, it's the equivalent of an English double negative. Therefore, there is now, no, not now, ever any condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Our fourth, therefore, is one of dedication and one of commitment that we see here. Secondly, in terms of its being previously explained, well, we've been looking at the mercies of God. Paul's been talking about what we deserved in terms of condemnation, but instead of that, we don't receive that, and it's because of God's mercy that he shows to us. In fact, Paul calls, calls God the father of mercy in 2 Corinthians 1.3, where he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, there it is, Father of mercies and God of all comfort. He is the Father. He is the source of all mercy, and we're so thankful. We never want to pray, Lord, just give me what I deserve. You, ne you, never, you never want that. You go before a judge, and you know that you know that you know you're guilty. You never ask for justice. You always ask for mercy. Grace, he gives us what we don't deserve. He gives us his, his, uh, his favor, his love, and so forth. Mercy, he withholds what we do deserve, which is his wrath and his judgment. Jeremiah makes it very clear in writing in Lamentations 3.22, through the Lord's mercies, or because of, mercies we are not consumed, because his compassions fail now. Not they are new every morning, great is your faithfulness. So in view of God's mercy, then he calls us to a life of commitment. And therefore, uh, there's a, there's, the idea is this. We come to faith in Christ. There's a point in time as Christians <clears throat> when we should arrive at this logical conclusion that we should be completely committed to the Lord Jesus Christ and be able to say, Lord, whatever your will is, that's what I want, no matter what it is. Uh, and that's, that's not necessarily what we pray. When we come to faith in Christ, we just put our faith in Jesus. He died at the cross for our sins. We want to be forgiven. That issue is settled. We're justified. He begins that process of sanctification in our lives. But Paul says, ultimately, when I understand what God has done for me, this should lead to something else. It can be summarized in the classic hymn of Isaac Watts. <clears throat> Isaac Watts used to give his father a hard time about uh, how lousy he thought the music was in the church in his day. So his father said, well, why don't you do something about it? <clears throat> and he did. He wrote 600 hymns. <clears throat> and one of them, maybe his most well-known, is When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. And he writes there, When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. Here's the suggestion by Paul that we're doing this. That we actually, if we're unsure about this idea of fully committing our lives to the Lord, here's the suggestion. Survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. My richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. And that's something sometimes we need to do. Poor contempt on our pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast. Save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns impose so rich a crown? Were the whole realm of nature mine, I owned the whole world, that were an offering far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demand, demands my soul, my life, my all. That's Paul's point. If we really understand what Christ has done for us, <clears throat> that God left heaven, was born in a manger, lived a perfect sinless life, and then knowingly went to the cross, then just go to the cross, knew that he would be brutalized and beaten to a pulp uh, the day before. Did it, went to the cross, was nailed to a cross, uh, and uh, took upon him the sin of the entire world. That he would be separated at a point in time in terms of his fellowship with God the Father that he had known from all eternity as he takes the sin of the world upon him. And he did it all for you and I. When I survey the wondrous cross, that's Paul's point. That's what we've been doing, in a sense, in trying to understand this whole issue of salvation and God's work in our lives. So previously, that's what's been said. 
And it leads to this plea uh, that we see here in the second half of verse 1, where we'd say Paul pleads with believers to be totally dedicated. He says there that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable servant. So he begins with a plea, I beseech you therefore. That's a term that uh, we all use a lot, of course. I beseech you, dear, that we stop for lunch. On the way. No, actually, we don't use that a lot. Uh, it means to be called alongside. It's used in counseling. It's used in encouraging. But there's a sense of urgency with it. In Romans 15.30, it's translated, Now I beg you. In Romans 16.17, it's translated, I urge you. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 4.1, which again is one of these turning points like we have here, three chapters in F. <clears throat> to the church in Ephesus, Paul's been laying out this wonderful doctrine of acceptance, of adoption, of redemption, of forgiveness, of inheritance, the seal of the Holy Spirit in our lives, the life of grace, the citizenship in heaven, and so forth. And then he says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, there's our word, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Wow. After all that, Paul's saying, think, just think this through, all that we have in Christ. He goes, then, that word again, I beseech you, I plead with you, I beg you. Is there a sense of an urgency? Can I be the counselor that comes along and says, this is really the right thing to do, that you walk in a worthy manner for which you were called? He says in Ephesians, and he says to us here that we would be dedicated to the Lord. Well, the plea includes the dedication of our bodies. Secondly, present your bodies, the Greek word, Present is a technical term, and it's used for ritual sacrifice. <clears throat> in other words, this brings an image to the mind, of, at least of the Jewish listeners, most of whom are reading this letter. The Gentiles got included and involved there as we got through chapter uh, 11. But they are to present their bodies, again, which is certainly more than skin and bones. It means the totality of who we are, uh, that we would present it like a sacrifice, give it over to uh, the Lord as opposed to giving our bodies over to sinful pleasures uh, in those purposes. It's uh, uh, summarized here by Paul in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, where he says our bodies really are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He says there, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own, for you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body, same idea, and in your spirit, which are God. So there's a plea. It's like a sacrifice. Our bodies, they are to be presented like a sacrifice to the Lord. Uh, the third thing about the plea is a living sacrifice. In a sense, living sacrifice is like an oxymoron. Two words that go together that have opposite meanings. <laughs> a sacrifice is normally dead, but in this case it's living. Kind of like jumbo shrimp. Two words that go together that have opposite meanings. Uh, meanings and I'll and I'll stop while I'm ahead on that one but uh, notice uh, again it's the uh, the sacrifice uh, is the animal itself so it's not the idea that we're bringing a sacrifice no it's the idea that we are the sacrifice that's uh, that's the terminology that's uh, being used there in terms of what offering and we've mentioned this before because it's kind of a classic verse it's a burnt offering <clears throat> again most uh, most offerings were brought uh, there would be a portion that would brought uh, the animal and the temple would be, would be killed uh, and uh, its blood would be let out uh, and then a portion of the meat of the animal, whether it was a bull or goat or a sheep, uh, <laughs> they would be, uh, uh, the tri-tip would all go to the priest and the uh, pork, no, the, uh, it, you know, a portion would go to the priest. Uh, and they would consume it, and of course the rest would be on the altar. If there was a fellowship offering, a family came in, a portion would be cut aside, and basically they would barbecue it uh, right there in the temple, and they would consume the meat, uh, and then on the altar the other portion is burnt, in a sense consumed by God. <clears throat> so they're having a communion, they're having a meal with God in sense. It was as close as they, they could get, and of course in their culture, like in our culture here, eating together is a really big deal. And, uh, and so that was as close as they could get. But the burnt offering is different because it went on, everything went on to the altar and everything was completely consumed. There was nothing <laughs> left over. It was not required. It was just, if you wanted to say to God, I am completely dedicated to you. 
you gave one of those offerings. And that's the picture, that's the image here. Uh, but again, the problem is, it's a living sacrifice. There's only two times in the Bible where we find a living sacrifice. One of them is in Genesis chapter 22 and a young man named Isaac. Again, most, sac most sacrifices, the animal is killed. It's dead when it goes up there. So this is a very interesting uh, uh, set of words that Paul uses here. Now you remember the story of Isaac when he's told to take your son, your only son, Isaac, and take him to a place that I will show you, which ends up being Mount Moriah, which ends up being basically the place where Jesus dies on the cross then uh, later uh, in, in history. He takes him up there and keep in mind that Isaac is the living sacrifice and he's no kid. I mean, it may show that a Sunday school flannel graph, little Isaac. He's a young man. He's probably late 20s. He can even be into his early 30s. He knows exactly what's going on. He's not like, <clears throat> so dad, you're stacking rocks up. It looks just like an altar. Wow, you're pouring up uh, kindling and now a bunch of wood on top of it. It looks just like an altar. And now you're tying me up and laying me on here. Sure seems like a sacrifice to me. What's go no, he knows exactly what's going on. And obviously his, his father is 100 years plus. If he doesn't volunteer, if he's not buying into it, if he's not trusting the Lord as well, this doesn't happen. Isaac is a living sacrifice. And of course, you know the rest of the story that before Abraham takes the knife to sacrifice his son, which was God's, uh, never God's intention. It was just a testing of Abraham to see if he was too focused on the family. But in terms that uh, he wasn't, uh, he takes his son that he loves, puts him up there. God intervenes with his voice, withhold your hand, and then provides uh, the ram who becomes the sacrifice. And we learn of, about uh, the idea of one taking the place of the other so that one could be spared. Isaac was a living sacrifice who lived again, in a sense, figuratively anyway, he rose from the dead, a living sacrifice. The second one, of course, is the obvious, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ goes to the altar of the cross to sacrifice his life for our sins, and he's fully alive, obviously, when he goes to, uh, to the cross. He dies on the cross as that living sacrifice, and then, of course, he rises again. So a living sacrifice, we'd say, wow, that's, that's complete commitment. That's complete dedication. Uh, I see what Paul is saying here. Uh, the verb present here means to present once for all. And uh, as I mentioned before, I think that's important. We come to faith in Christ. We're growing in the Lord. Paul's hope that we understand for 11 chapters the, the whole issue of what it is to be a Christian, what it is to be saved, how we're saved, God's Holy Spirit working in our lives, the assurance that we have that nothing can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus, that God will keep all of his promises illustrated in the life of the nation of Israel. Understanding all of that, then uh, he says, there's a point in time when every believer should say, Lord, I give my life to you. I commit my life to you. I want to know your will. I'm going to do your will no matter what your will is. Because you know what? I'm not fearful of that anymore because I know you're my loving Heavenly Father. It's the devil's trap to make us think if we pray a prayer like that, if we say something like that to the Lord, in fact, we'll end up in a place that's very hot, high humidity, and lots of mosquitoes. You know, it's just uh, whatever it is, whatever my worst case scenario is, if I really let God have his way in my life, I just know it's going to be bad. That's all I know. That's a trap of the enemy, and nothing can be further from the truth. You might end up in a place like that, but I would just like to say, if you did, you'd be having the greatest time of your life. It would be a tremendous blessing because you would know that you're in the center of God's will. God's using you for his eternal purposes, but probably that's not the case. But God does have a wonderful plan for each of our lives that sometimes we never fully know unless we once for all present our bodies as a living sacrifice holy unto him, like a burnt offering, like in a complete dedication, like in the case of Isaac, like in the case of Jesus. To present means to stand alongside of. And it's used in a couple of different ways. And one of them I find fascinating, Luke chapter 2, used of Jesus again, but this is when Joseph and Mary bring him in to be, well, that's our word, dedicated. Verse 22 there in Luke says, 
Now when the days of her purification, Mary, according to the law of Moses, were completed, <coughs> they, Joseph and Mary, brought him, Jesus, to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. And you remember the whole story. <coughs> There's some words of prophecy over them, and they're following the law of Moses, but they're bringing their child in to be dedicated, to be presented to the Lord. And we do that here. Parents bring in their kids. You should bring in your kids, your babies, or whatever age they are. We bring them up before the congregation, and they are dedicating their children to the Lord. I get to hold them. I get to talk to them a little bit uh, and pray uh, over them. But ultimately, what's being done is a decision by the parents that are saying, I want my child to be able to know the Lord, to walk with the Lord, to have a godly life, to enjoy what it is to know uh, the hope of heaven in his life and to be used by God. That's our desire. That's what we want. That's what we want to see happen. And we need you as the church to help us in this endeavor because it's going to be all of our prayers working together. So please pray with me and pray for me that this will happen to my child. I'm dedicating him. I'm dedicating her to the Lord. And, it's, uh, uh, and certainly uh, it's a wonderful thing. Now, the ultimate dedication, child dedication, of course, is Hannah and Samuel in the Old Testament. Same concept, same idea. She's unable to have a child. She prays. She says, if you give me a child, I'll dedicate him to you. Well, she actually leaves him at the temple. I just want to mention, if you have your child dedicated here, don't bring him back the next day. I won't be here. And uh, even if it's just for eight hours while you go to the beach, forget it. Uh, it's the idea of what you're going to be doing. But with, uh, with uh, Samuel, he was literally left there. That's a picture of, of dedication, of complete commitment. That's the idea here in dedication. <clears throat> For the plea is that we would be holy. Here Paul is uh, saying that we should be, what we're offering to the Lord should be holy. Our bodies should be holy. He's talking about morality and how we live our lives. 2 Corinthians 6, 14, Paul writing it again, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Sometimes we quote this verse to say that uh, uh, men and women shouldn't be married together unless they're both believers, unequally yoked. But there's a much broader application other than that. For what fellowship has righteousness and lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial, or a false god? Or what part has an unbeliever with an, uh, a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Which is a, a wonderful thing and we praise the Lord for that. Uh, it's all pretty logical to me. Uh, all of these uh, questions. Would we do that? Can we do that? Well, absolutely not. We wouldn't want to do that. Why would we do that? We should live a moral life because after all, our bodies, our physical bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit where he resides within us. What would darkness have to do with light? That whole idea here. And then he continues with a therefore uh, there in chapter 7 of 2 Corinthians. Therefore, having these promises Beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So it affects our bodies. What are we presenting our bodies to? He says it should be to holiness. And then five, he gives us a plea, the motivation acceptable unto God. NIV says pleasing unto God. Why would we do all of this? Just because we want to. <laughs> Because, well, it's logical, it's reasonable, he's going to get to that. Uh, but it's, uh, we just want to please the Lord. We recognize how much he's done for us, how much he loves for us, how much he cares for us. Uh, the, you know, and just the changes he's, uh, he's brought about uh, in, in our lives. Wow, we should want to do that which is, uh, is pleasing to him. I, uh, I went in to see uh, the dermatologist this week, as uh, all of us old surfers should do periodically <laughs> to get the little <laughs> our little places uh, frozen and uh, cut off that uh, uh, we hope won't develop into uh, cancer. And uh, uh, I was seeing the, the doctor, and and um, you know they're 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 checking you out. You know every little pimple bop. You know looking at this little magnify. He comes down the the scar that runs. You know about eight inches down the inside of my arm. Notices every scar I've got. You know and asks me is the I bought them all. I said, well, that's a long story. You don't want to know. I cut myself on some glass or whatever. But uh, 
<laughs> you know, it's just interesting. You know, that, there's a story behind, behind that one. And, uh, and I said, it's, it's too long to go into. I'm just going to summarize it. First wife. And we'll just end it right there, you know. <laughs> <clears throat> and, uh, well, I've been held at uh, knife point, but uh, never got poked. Well, they weren't aiming for my, uh, my arm, I can tell you that. But uh, it's just reminders of what God has done, the transformation, the, uh, the changes. And it should cause us to want to please, to please the Lord when we think about how good he is. That's the motivation. And then six, the plea is reasonable, which is your reasonable service. And that's what I've been referring to here. The Greek word is logi, uh, logikos, which is uh, logical. It's where we get our word logical. True worship is offering ourselves to God. It's reasonable, uh, is logical. A total commitment to God to do his will is rational. Uh, and anything short of that would be irrational. God loves me. He cares about me. He knows everything. Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments, his past beyond uh, tracing out. Who's known the mind of the Lord? Who's been his counselor? Nobody. But I don't know that I can really trust him, you know. I don't know that, you know, I mean, I've kind of got this thing figured out about my life, what I should be doing. Are you kidding me? You know, Paul says, that's irrational. It's irrational. To not want God to guide and direct you your life. Uh, who, are, who are we kidding here? And again, it's the devil's trap that would say, you know better. <laughs> and you can't trust God. Uh, be glad you're saved. Don't push your luck is the idea. Uh, which, which is a, a lie of the enemy. Again, uh, nothing else makes sense. A halfway commitment is irrational. Uh, and so we really should be saying, everything is yours, Lord. Uh, of course, but not this relationship over here. That's a little, you know, and I've got this little thing, you know, but everything. No, actually, it's, it's irrational to do that. Have those conversations uh, with God. One writer said, to be a Christian means to give as much of myself as I can to as much of Jesus as I know. And that's part of the point, too. Uh, as we're growing through our study in Romans and, of course, the rest of God's word, we're growing to, to know God. And the more we know of him, the more we should be trusting him. The longer I walk with him, the greater my commitment should be. My commitment to the Lord should not be decreasing as I go through time. It should not plateau off. Actually, my commitment to the Lord should be growing and growing and growing stronger uh, each and every day. I would dare say that Charlie at 99 is more committed to the Lord than he was at 92 when he first came to know the Lord. He's had a whole seven years to grow in the Lord. You didn't know that he was a babe in Christ, just a child. But uh, that's the way it should be. We all should be more committed to the Lord. Why? Because, well, we just keep seeing his faithfulness, his mercy. And, and, uh, and when I blow it and I don't do it right, he's still there. He's still faithful uh, to me. We should be growing in our commitment. Seven, the plea involves our service. <clears throat> which is your reasonable service. We could translate that ministry. We've all really got one, some way, some ability, some gifting, some place to be able to uh, serve others in the name of Jesus Christ. NIV uh, translates it, which is your spiritual worship, which really isn't a good translation there. It's really service. It's our service to the Lord. Our service to the Lord is done every day that we get up. And uh, we'd say sometimes the problem with a living sacrifice is they have a tendency to crawl off the altar. It's a one-time commitment, but sometimes we need to remake that commitment every morning when we get up uh, and be committed to him. And if we do, that day will be like worship to the Lord, whatever it is uh, and whatever we go, whatever we're doing. The call to total commitment applies equally to all. Notice again at the beginning of the verse, I beseech you there, leaders of the church. Oh, actually, it doesn't say that. It's brethren. Sorry, gals, you're not off the hook. It's just an indication that it's everybody. This is something for everybody. It's not a church leader deal. Uh, it's just simply this is the normal Christian uh, experience. So how do we know? How do we know we've made this kind of commitment, this level of commitment to the Lord? Well, he's going to tell us in verse 2. Because if we have, then we're no longer being conformed to the pattern of this world. In fact... There's a renewal in our mind that's going on that brings transformation. So let's take a look at that. We need to remember everything that was previously stated in Romans. He pleads with us for total dedication. But notice there's 
Three, a pattern to avoid in verse two. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So uh, two commands, one negative, one positive. Don't be conformed, uh, be transformed. And we'd say that we're not conformed to the pattern of this world. It's very important to see that the word pattern comes from the uh, Greek word, or the root word schema, where we get our word uh, scheme. So there's a scheme that's out there, and the, wor the term world really means age. It's a passing age. We could say, don't get caught up into the scheme of this passing evil age. And the other thing that Paul says uh, that uh, we don't really see in the English, there's the assumption by Paul that we are. He's really saying, stop doing this. Stop being caught up into the scheme of this passing uh, evil age. And, uh, and one of the reasons that it's easy for that to happen is because, well, it's not all that evil. I mean, you know, there's a lot of good things uh, in this world, and we live in one of the most beautiful places in the world. And there's a, there's a lot of great things that are out there that we can do and be involved in that uh, we can enjoy and everything. And we can become oblivious to some degree that, well, it really is an evil age that we're, we're living in. And we happen to be in uh, and live in, uh, and if you've, you've been born and raised here and never traveled outside of this culture that we're in, you don't realize how fortunate you are. And just to summarize and say, you can travel to a lot of places in the world and there's no aloha, I can just tell you. It's just different. The, the Polynesian roots of our culture, we're certainly influenced by a lot of different cultures, is one that says, I want to connect with you. That's why you might hear someone say, and you may not understand them at the time, so what, where you went grad? And what they mean by that is, where did you graduate from high school? Because they want to know, can I establish a connection with you? Uh, uh, if you went there, then you know what? My cousin went there too. Hey, do you know my cousin? Well, what's your, what's your, what's your mother's last name? So what's your mother's maiden name? And if you talk to somebody in Hawaii long enough, you'll find out somehow you're related. If you just keep going, you just keep going, and so, you know, good tip if you get pulled over by the police, by the way. But uh, if you just keep going long enough, there's some relation somehow. Your auntie may have been his teacher in sixth grade. You never know. Why, why is, am I, I'm not making this up, right? This is like normal kind of stuff happens all the time. Why is that? Because there's an attempt to connect uh, and be a part of somebody else's life. And, and you don't find that in other places. This is very unique. There's things in the culture, there's things in the world that we can gravitate to. They're not evil, they're not bad, but there is evil out there. And we can, because of those things, become oblivious to the scheme of this world and what's happening. Now John summarizes in 1 John 2 what this scheme is. It involves the lust of our eyes, the lust of our flesh, and the pride of our life. And again, if you could go back and do our study in Matthew 4, and look at the, the nature of temptation and how it works and how it operates in the world, uh, it would fit uh, very good with this uh, message here as well. Uh, but we need to be careful because it is an evil age that we live in. And if you're not sure about that, uh, then just watch the evening news. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of evil things that are, that are going on. There's a lot of evil things that are happening to Christians today. In Syria, on both sides, Christians are being killed. They're being killed by the Assad government, and the, uh, the people that are opposing them, that we're talking about arming, are killing Christians left and right. I'm talking about beheading them in public right now in Syria. And those are the guys we're talking about backing up. It's a crazy world that's out there. Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood are blaming the Coptic Christians on the overturn of Morsi and putting them out of office. I'm sorry, they only make up 9% of the country. I don't think they could overturn the entire government. But because of that, Christians have been killed, homes have been burned, churches have been burned. That's all going on right now. There's an evil age that's, uh, that's going on. I was kind of caught by uh, one story I read about in the news that just happened this last week, and that is in, uh, in Texas. Uh, they just, uh, along with uh, several states now, they've passed uh, a new pro-life measure that would limit abortion uh, after 20 weeks. Uh, the uh, media had gone crazy over it, uh, saying, uh, you know, this radical piece of legislation. But the radical piece of legislation agrees with 70% of Americans. 70% of Americans say abortion is always wrong after 28 weeks. That's a baby, can feel pain, 
pretty much there. Uh, that's wrong. 70% of Americans, which is to say that the mainstream media on this issue is not mainstream. Uh, in fact, they won't even report it, right? You didn't hear that. But the evil part of it was very interesting. Not as only is it not reported or misreported uh, in the news when it was happening, but the last session when they were ready to give a vote, uh, they actually had to search people coming into the, uh, the gallery up above to watch the vote. Uh, and the things they took away from the pro-abortion crowd were things like bricks, urine, feces, and other things they had planned on pelting and throwing the pro-life legislators below. When it did pass, and they knew they had the votes to pass it, uh, the Christians in the crowd, maybe even joined by others because they're familiar with it, were so thankful they just broke out and sang Amazing Grace. The beautiful melody, of course, was beginning to be drowned out by the other crowd who were chanting Hail Satan over and over again. You can't make this stuff up. There's an evil world that's out there. It's an age and it's a scheme. And Paul says, stop. Because even as a believer, you can start to be conformed. Now, I like the J.B. Uh, Phillips translation the best. He says, literally, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. And it certainly will try to do that. And it can happen very subtly because there's some good things that are out there in the world, in our culture. And we can not see the evil age that's passing away. And all of a sudden, the music, the TV, the movies... All these things that basically have an agenda uh, can influence our lives tremendously. So that's what we're to stop doing. The positive command is wonderful. It is to be transformed uh, by the renewing of your mind. And the language here is very graphic. Uh, it's, uh, again, that word transformed, we just say the Greek in a sense into English. <clears throat> it's a metamorphosis. And, uh, and again, it's that internal transformation that we know of. Well, we're watching it in our house right now, actually. It's going on. Wow, you guys are being transformed in Jesus so much you can watch it? No, I'm talking about caterpillars. Uh, yeah, Melissa was down at the park where her mom used to take her, and so she knows where the crown flowers are, and the crown flower bushes are the ones that have the caterpillars, and if you go look at the backside of the leaves, Carefully, I can never find it, but if you look carefully, you can find the caterpillars and take the leaves and bring them home. So now uh, her kids, our grandkids, are watching the metamorphosis go on. Uh, and eventually, you know, they're going to get bigger. Uh, they're going to do the cocoon and they'll come out this beautiful butterfly. That's the word uh, that's being used here. Uh, it's used in a couple of other places in scripture that might help us. One is it's used of Jesus and what we call, well, we call it the Mount of Transfiguration, where he goes up to that mountaintop, northern Israel, beautiful area, it takes Peter, James, and John, and then allows, in a sense, for them to see him in his glorified state. And the Bible says it's like light, as they described it, was permeating right out through his body, so much that they could hardly look upon him. And of course, then they... Uh, Moses and Elijah are there in the voice of God the Father. Uh, this is my son. Listen to him. Uh, the transformation, the metamorphosis of, of Jesus. It's found in one other place of scripture I think is so important. We stopped in the middle of our Romans 8 study and we went to it and did a whole study on 2 Corinthians 3.18 uh, which uh, reads, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed, that's our word metamorphosis, into the same image from glory to glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord. But we all, all of us, and again it's a reference to Moses, uh, Moses would uh, uh, be in direct contact with God up on Mount Sinai, uh, and as a result when he came down, apparently it looked like he got nuked, he'd just be glowing, you know, because he was... God's presence would, uh, would be upon him, his glory. He would stand in his glory. It would be obvious. He was face would be unveiled. But when he came back before the people, he put a veil over his face. <clears throat> he didn't want to see them uh, and them to know that the glory was fading. That's the image. That's the illustration. Paul says it's like that for us. We with unveiled faces, we can stand in God's presence. We can behold as a mirror. James tells us the mirror is like the word of God. We can stand and behold God in his word. And when we do that with, because we have an unfailed face, we will actually then 
receive to us his glory. It will be seen. It will be a transformation. We're being transformed into the same image from glory, God's glory, to our glory, just as by the Spirit of God. It's a work of the Spirit of God uh, in, in our lives. And, uh, and again, it's not just, you mean if I read 20 chapters a day, I'll be more transformed? I'm reading 40. No, that's, that's not it, although I'm not uh, saying that's a bad idea. Uh, read what you can read to understand it and listen to it and allow God to speak to your heart. And then you talk back to him saying, yes, Lord, that's what I want. And I understand that. And I'm corrected there. I'm encouraged that you have a conversation with God through his word and spend time and see his glory in his word and there's transformation. Two things, though, about this word in a Greek text. In our passage, as well as the one of 2 Corinthians 3.18, it's be transformed, which is called uh, passive imperative. This means it's not something we actually do. It's something done to us. We're passive. In other words, I spend time in the word. I'm not transforming myself by that. It's something the Holy Spirit does to me. It's just the nature of his work that he's doing to me. And that's Paul's point uh, uh, here also in our Romans passage. The other thing, it's present tense, which means it's ongoing. It's a process that's taking place. And we would say it's a gradual process. And we wished it wasn't. We should just kind of happen. Can I just kind of do it this week and then be like Jesus next week? You know, because my wife would like me more. You know, I mean, we, I think there's times in our lives when we all wish, especially when those things come out of our mouth, the words, and you're trying to get, get them back in, but it's too late or whatever it might be. It's like we wish this transformation was, uh, can we just kind of step this up here a little bit more? But it's, it is a process, uh, and it's a gradual process, uh, but it is a transformation, that, uh, and I think that uh, we should all desire that in our lives. But there's a pattern to avoid, uh, as well as a transformation. Notice it's primarily uh, in the mind. And then, his, uh, our last point here, a renewed mind then can prove or think clearly. The second half of verse 2, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? So a renewed mind will be able to prove what's, what's good. This word is used 22 times in the New Testament. Used of uh, metals that have been tested in fire so you can prove their, uh, their worth. Uh, in other words, <laughs> the more of a transformation that's gone on us, the cl more clearly we'll be able to see what God's will is. Uh, so we can walk in it, so we can be in it, so that we can do it. We can understand what's good, what's pleasing, uh, perfect, or mature. Uh, and the, the lack of transformation will affect our ability to be able to understand what God's will is. How do we know if we're being transformed? Well, that's determined by if we've really made that commitment to the Lord. Your will, whatever you say, I'm doing it, Lord. I'm fully committed to you. If we haven't said that, then we're going to have trouble in the other areas and ultimately trouble even knowing what God's will is, discerning what really is good out there in this world. The New English Bible says it this way, then you'll be able to discern the will of God and know what is good, acceptable, uh, and perfect. I like what the uh, Scottish preacher Alexander McLaren said, to know beyond doubt what I ought to do, and knowing to do it seems to me to be heaven on earth. And the man that has it needs little more. In other words, from his understanding of that, that if I understand God and who he is and, uh, and, uh, and how much he loves me and how he designed me specifically and he knows everything about me and he's got something very specific to me. And when I'm in the middle of doing that very specific thing, that's when I'm fully realized that... Uh, who he meant me to be. And there's, there's, there's nothing uh, better than that. There's nothing better uh, than that. Uh, he says it's like heaven on earth. But you can't get there unless you've made the commitment first. The commitment leads to our transformation as we spend time with the Lord in prayer and in his word. It's not something we do. It's, we're passive. It's something that's done to us. But it leads to our ability to understand and know what God's uh, will is his good and pleasing and perfect will again the last uh, line of that Isaac Watts hymn were the whole realm of nature mine there were there that were an offering far too small love so amazing so divine 
demands my soul, my life, my all. Paul says it's reasonable. He says it's the least we can do. If we're not sure, if you're not sure, go back and start reading through Romans again. See that you're condemned without God and there is no hope for you. But God intervenes. And as we place our faith in him, he justifies us. And then he gives us his Holy Spirit to lead and guide and direct our lives. And he is so good to us and so gracious to us. So if you're having trouble knowing God's will, look upon the wondrous cross. and Think about Jesus' death for you. Contemplate to that till you can say, Lord, I give my life to you. I commit my will to you. Begin to spend time with an unveiled face in his word that you might be transformed. I can tell you it's pretty exciting. I wish it wasn't so gradual, but I'm sure thankful for what he's done in my life and uh, in your lives as well. And I know that he's got a lot more to, to do. And I just want to say this. I remember reading uh, uh, Alan Redfath, one of my favorite authors, when we first started the church <coughs> a few decades ago. I remember reading an Alan Redfath book. He said that, uh, he said that uh, if you could have uh, 90 people that were... 80% committed to the Lord, or you could have 10 people that were 100% committed to the Lord, which would you take? And at that time, I would say, give me the 90 and I'll work on the, the other 10% and I'll, but you know, that, obviously that's, that's not the right answer. The right answer is give me 10 that are fully committed, because then you'll turn the world upside down. Uh, you'll be changed and you'll change people around you. And there's just no substitute for that. Is, that. is that pretty clear? There's no substitute for that idea of being fully committed to, uh, to something. And, uh, and there's nothing more that we should be fully committed to and motivated to please other than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray.
Your hope has come.